Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Dr. Michelle Berkland. I'm the Chief Science Officer here at Peria. And this is our Living Well interview series where we give you the tools and foundation to live a healthy life. And we introduce you to inspiring people who are focused on helping others find wellness in all aspects of their life. And this is going to be a very fun and educational interview today on women challenging the roles, embracing new perspectives on women and the feminine. So welcome, Dominique. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you. So Dominique is a gestalt therapist, a psychotherapist, a lecturer and designer of Equal Gosh. Stung. Now that is probably not the best pronunciation. You can you can tell me the <laughs> the correct way to say that if you'd like. Ek, yeah, it, it's Ecus, like horse in Latin, and uh -huh. Gestaltung from Gestalt therapy. Beautiful, <laughs> much better said. So, uh, she has been leading groups for over forty years. Her travels have led her to meet Native American women, Maori medicine women of different traditions, who have accompanied her in transformative passages, and her vision of the world: life, impermanence, interdependence, circularity, posture, sovereignty, and the social role of women. So, many amazing things to talk about today. Thank you so much for joining us. This will be very informative and, and you have a beautiful story. Um, so before we get started, I want to hear more about your background. Um, what created this desire for you to learn more about women, uh, Native American cultures? Tell us how this began. Tell us your story. Well, I didn't decide anything. I didn't even know it existed. It just happened to me. I was traveling, I ran away when I was 16. Um, I just wanted to discover the world and I didn't know anything about Indians besides uh, the movies my mom used to watch, uh, American movies mostly. So even this image of uh, native peoples uh, was not correct and uh, it was a big fantasy. Uh, and when I arrived in North America, I arrived in Canada. This was probably 1979. Uh, I didn't see any Indians and I wasn't particularly searching for them. So this came later. It was a side effect of traveling. So it, it found you more than you finding it. You it came across. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. So, Let's talk about um, some of the memorable, memorable experiences you had from spending time with these different women. Tell us about how you found, how they found you across your journey when you entered Canada and, and about that time. Okay, so the, I guess the most important uh, event which um, provoked everything that would follow uh, happened in 1982 and um, I, I was invited to a medicine woman circle and I was 23 years old, I had no idea what this meant. I certainly was not a medicine woman, um, very young and green and so I went, I was curious, I was invited and I went. And it was a gathering of more than 30 women. Um, and there were five women. I don't know if they're shamans, medicine women, or whatever. I didn't know. Uh, and one of them was the Hani Iwahu, a very well-known uh, person in the um, spiritual teachings uh, in North America, a Cherokee. Another one was grandmother uh, Doris Morning Dove Minkler, who died. And so, and, and three others, and there was also a Buddhist nun. And at one point in these three days, I was invited to a talking stick circle. Um, I was one of the last ones uh, to speak. And when it came to me, I started trembling and um, I grabbed the stick as if I was uh, holding on to life <laughs> and felt sucked up in, um, uh, what do you say, a tourbillon. Um, spiral uh, mm -hmm. yeah I felt aspired in a spiral and and saw myself hanging above the earth um, and the earth was a ball between my legs and it was all very strange the whole thing was very strange and 
at the end of the circle, we were all invited to talk about this experience. And when I told my story, um, grandmother Doris um, was very interested and she invited me to come sit with her after this circle. And she started by, by uh, talking about spider woman. I had no clue, no idea what is this, what's going on. And at the same time, um, she gave me a job to do. I had to go pick up two pieces of wood, two meters long, 10 centimeters diameter and go get rope and hang things. So in short, I made a weaving device and started weaving. With a, she brought me a basket with ribbons and, and wool and all kinds of things. So I did, I started weaving. And there were two other women with me or three, I don't quite remember. Um, the third day I was the last one. I just got into the weaving like crazy and wove every time I had a free minute. Every day she came to sit next to me with a cup of coffee, coffee and just went, hmm, hmm, and then left. And the fourth day, I was the last one, uh, she told me to come sit next to her and said that when my basket would be full, um, I would have to go back to my people so that these eggs can hatch, which is what I did. I came back to Europe and started uh, women's circles. Very nice, very nice. So, um, how did you, how, how long were you there at, um, in Canada learning all these different things? Um, with uh, it was Canada, it was the US also, um, Vermont, upstate New York, um, California, Arizona. Uh, I met other native women and also Hawaii and Alaska. So it's a long story. <laughs> so, so this beginning journey and being in this women's circle, it inspired you and inspired all of these journeys uh, throughout the States and everywhere to kind of engage with these women. Well, yes, it just, it just happened. It was, um, as I said before, side effects of traveling. Mm -hmm. I met people and uh, how how it goes, I cannot explain. It's just the synchronicities, coincidences. And uh, I didn't know, I knew I was on a sort of a quest, but I didn't know what I was searching. So the first thing was to find out what what is it I'm searching. Mm -hmm. And it took me many years. It, it's not, not even finished. Uh, I guess it will never finish. Right, right. I think I think that's part of all of us too. It's it's always a, a journey. It's always part of the journey. So, um, yeah. what did you learn, or what what kind of like uh, changed when you spent this time with this woman? Um, what viewpoints changed, or how did you change um, after going through these experiences? Um, hmm. That's also a very long story. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say about that? It changed. It certainly changed my view of the world because uh, I'm European, uh, Flemish, born in a small Flemish town, which is more than a thousand years old. I come from a very old culture with very traditional values. Um, um, so when I went to North America, the first thing I noticed is that it was not so tight. People were not so narrow in their, their views of life, of the world, of their um, personal anthropology, I would say, their vision of uh, what is it to be human, what's, why do we exist, all these existential questions. Uh, until then, I only had the, the Catholic religion where I found a few answers, but they were not satisfying. I had read some books from uh, Buddhists, I had more answers, but still it was all very theoretical. And what changed the most for me is that I had to come down from this little cloud um, because everything I had learned about spirituality or the, the, the answers to existential questions was elevate, elevate yourself. And this was a radical change with um, especially Native American women because they told me to go for my roots and not for my wings. And, yeah. and 
the whole thing was that uh, women and men, as I understood it, um, we come from different directions and we meet somewhere in the middle. So they say that male energy is active, has to make an effort and go up. And feminine energy is passive. You can find this everywhere in, in the Chinese uh, writings. Um, and, and this means that if you have something which is, uh, uh, let's say, down here, uh, this object, for example, if I want to bring it up, I have to make an effort. This costs me an effort. But if I am passive, I have to stop resisting. And if I let go, what happens? It just falls, no effort. So men and male energy costs an effort, where feminine energy costs letting go. And this was very mystical for me. What, what does that mean? How do I do that? And it took me many years to, um, to apply this um, on the emotional level, on the physical level, and on the mental level. And, and I suppose the spiritual happens as an integration of all. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest change for me. I stopped looking for elevated whatever uh, and, and going down. In French, we say au ras des pâquerettes, which means that uh, we're um, um, brushing the, um, how do you call them, daffodils? The little flowers? Uh -huh. Daffodils. 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 Yeah, so we, we just brush the, the tip of the daffodils. That means that uh, if I do something, if I say something, I have um, um, an explanation for it. I know what I'm doing. So I'm not playing ritual. I'm not playing spiritual or illuminated. I want to know what I'm doing, why I'm doing, and what it brings. So it's about experience more than theory. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a true European, uh, middle class, uh, blah, 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 uh, I had to let go of my theories. Yeah, which, which is hard, which is hard for all of us, letting go of all those beliefs that we collected when we were younger about everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. So developing mental flexibility, emotional flexibility, uh, resilience. So um, tell me more about um, the practices, the celebrations, um, the rites of passage for women, the feminine energy, uh, women's menstruation, all of these different things that, um, that you teach and um, celebrate and unify women about. So tell us more about this part of uh, what you do in your practice and how that's all combined. Okay, so for me, the most important is uh, women's circles, that women sit again in circles mm -hmm. together and talk about uh, all these things happening right now. Um, when I started 30 or 40 years ago, uh, nobody in Europe spoke about this. It was all very mystical, otherworldly, exotic, uh, and not very welcome because we had um, the, the leftovers of the the feminist movement of the 70s, where there was a lot of uh, intestine uh, fighting going on. And because all these women were, of course, products of patriarchal uh, culture and uh, very competitive, defensive, a bit paranoid. So there was a lot of fighting and arguing going on. And um, the women's circles were fighting arenas. I have some hard memories and sad memories of this. However, it was the beginning of something great. So uh, I also want to honor these women uh, who have done the hard work so that we can do what we're doing now and the younger ones. Um, uh, so it, it's about learning to talk to each other again and listening. And so we're doing this with the, the seven rules of a, of a talking stick. Um, I don't really use the stick. It's more about the rules. So uh, some, some of these rules are speaking uh, in the first person, no naming of other people, talking about oneself, not talking about others, um, and saying, uh, I heard when we're finished, uh, when someone is finished speaking. 
and and when we are finished we say i have spoken and this in the circle and um this is where gestalt therapy comes in i invite women to be less elusive and more uh, direct in what they say so in, in, instead of talking with a distance about things that that have happened i'm inviting women to talk about how they feel now with these things and this, of course, brings up um, very hot and emo emotional subjects. And, and the whole group takes care of that. Uh, and, and the fundaments of this, uh, this is another thing that I have learned in my travels, and not only with Native American women, also in Algeria and Morocco and with uh, Muslim people, because they live um, separated, the genders live separated, and they do some things together. And this separation is very important. Um, if we look at uh, initiation rites of, of many peoples on the planet and old European traditions, among others, the Basque, which live in Southwest France, um, a teenager boy always goes, maybe not always, okay. Uh, very often they had to, or still have to go on what, what is known today as a vision quest. The Basque, for example, the young people had to go naked for one complete year before they could come back. And this was their um, in initiation, right? It's for teenagers. And girls had to do this too. Um, what native people brought me is that men very often um, mostly do their initiation rites alone. They have to prove that they're worthy. They have to do things like a first kill or I don't know exactly what it is they do. Um, and, and we had very similar things for, for men. The, that in our fairy tales, the boys have three, um, what do you call is uh, three challenges that they have to overcome. Three times they have to do it. And uh, so, this is for men and for women, for girls, it, it's most of the time the first initiation right at uh, the, the age of adolescence is the menstruation, is the welcoming of the menarche in a group of uh, women who are still bleeding in, in access to the moon lodge, a place where women go together when they bleed, because we know that women living together in similar light conditions bleed together, the cycles adjust. So we have this group thing as women that we have lost with the, the nuclear family because now the women live separately. So we don't bleed together anymore. And we have artificial lights and we don't do these things together anymore. So the women's circles are very important with this because for women, it is together. Mm -hmm. Men, they do things alone. And this is a fundamental difference uh, in initiation rites and ceremonies for men and for women. And so how, how often do you hold these women's circles or do you recommend women hold these circles for groups that they start to? Is it like on a monthly basis for them to connect or? This is up as much to as each group. Choose. I like to work with the, the pagan uh, calendar because it's the closest we have here in Europe to uh, tribal traditions. Uh, one of the things my Indian teachers told me is uh, know your people. Who are your people? I had no idea my people who are what tribes. So I had to dig in my own history and the European history. And we have been colonized some two, four, maybe eight thousand years earlier than uh, Native Americans, uh, which is five, six hundred years ago. Um, and we have to dig much deeper uh, to go back to our traditions, the original traditions. Um, it's like uh, embers uh, hidden deep in, in the, the ashes, but they're still there. And we still have enough material that we can dig out and with the help of native women and they're very willing to help because it's for the sake of the planet mm -hmm. um, so let's put um, the, everything we have together and they have more than we have because uh, it's been destroyed in europe and the last blow to this what we had is the inquisition in the middle ages so european women um 
we have deep to dig, but we have it all. It's all in the fairy tales. Everything's right there. So it's all about rereading our history, re-understanding and extracting what we have. And then, of course, we have lost the ceremonies and the rites. This has definitely gone. But that's uh, where other uh, women from other peoples have managed to keep uh, this and sometimes to the price of in incredible sufferings and and even killings mm -hmm. um, but they have kept them and so I, I also honor and thank these women who have transmitted uh, in in the deepest uh, of, of the night for the soul uh, such such valuable knowledge and ceremonies because yeah. in, in in North America for example when the, the white priests came, my ancestors, and I apologize in their name, um, they had to hide from their own men because the, the women were quite free from what I heard and the stories they have told me. And, and so when the priests came, the women had to hide from their own men after some time. This is terrible. So, and yeah. then when the American laws changed, when they were allowed to, to, to practice their religion again without being killed for it, um, some of them decided to share with us, with other peoples, not only uh, Europeans and white peoples, but uh, well, in, uh, for all peoples, so that we will survive, uh, survive as a species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it all comes down to just discovering those roots and celebrating all different cultures and the practices they've been able to yeah. carry on yeah. and integrating those. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. But, and, and usually when we do circles, we have 2000 year years of sufferings. Women have incredible stories of, of rape, of being beaten, of being killed, of having to hide, of not being free. Uh, it's terrible. We have 2000 years of this to, to clear, to clean, with so much um, grief uh, and, and the grief can come out in these circles. Nobody is, is going to, um, how do you say this, to make it ridiculous what a woman says. Nobody is going to minimize it. There is room for talking about this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, in, in one of my last circles, um, there was a woman um, who has been coming for two years to the circles and three years ago, she lost um, a young child. And so her suffering had no bottom. Um, and at some point I invited her to come next to her, to, to me, and if she would accept a hug. And with a um, self-defense trick, I turned her around and took her in my arms and started rocking her. And this was, a, 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 um, she started screaming and, and um, what's the word, sanglotter, uh, crying when the plexus is jumping you know, um, mm -hmm. very deep crying and the whole group, was, we were all crying with her. And it's beautiful that we create again spaces for women to express whatever, whatever it is they need to express, suffering, joy, to share this with other women. And so we find support. Right, it's, it's beautiful just to create that safe space for women to share everything they want yeah. without judgment and and knowing whatever they say, they'll be okay. I think that's a beautiful thing to join them yeah. together. Um, yeah. So, Michelle, I, my battery is low. I, I think I have to change device. My battery is uh, complaining. Okay, okay, let's, um, have... no problem. You can switch it and open up the link if you're switching devices right now from the same link that I sent you. Okay. So give me a minute. I'm closing sure, this one. Sure, no problem. Okay. Okay, so we are back live. Thank you everyone um, for holding for that moment. And thank you, Dominique, for persevering and <laughs> getting connected again too. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and we're, we're going to jump into the next question, which is about your passion for horse, horses and the workshops that you offer and how you um, combine your knowledge of gestalt therapy and your love for horses and, and how all of that ties together. So tell us okay. more about that. Okay. Um, what links this whole, whole thing together is that um, 
um, women and horses, we lost our freedom at the same time in history. When the Caucasian warriors came down uh, with the horses and, and burned everything on their way. Uh, so this coincides also with the invention of war. Uh, so horses were domesticated at the same time that women have become uh, uh, dominated. So um, we have a, a few things in common with horses, women, uh, uh, women and horses. And the most important thing being that we are group beings. So horses are herd animals. And as I have said before, um, I, I believe uh, and I have been told that women should do more things together. And, and become again group beings, uh, at least for some things, and to, to take good care of uh, relations uh, with other people, other humans, but also with everything that is, meaning animals, um, uh, the green growing ones, the, the, the swimming ones, the, the winged ones, uh, the invisible ones, and the minerals, uh, the elements, um, there is so much life out there. Um, so the, the, to be in good relation with all that is means more than, than just being in peace among humans. We have been treating with a lot of ignorance uh, other creatures. And uh, so a lot of people now are waking up to that also. And, and a lot of people are slowly seeing that what we're doing with horses is not okay. Uh, they're very much in pain with our human activities, which are also, uh, it's a one-way thing. We use horses. Horses don't use us. And when we're done with them, uh, we throw them away. Very few horses uh, get to live long. In France, the, the um, um, Average uh, lifespan uh, statistically for horses is seven or eight years, where in nature a horse can live up to 50 years. This is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So most horses live to be 35, let's say close to 40, and a few reach 50. Uh, that means that human activity is causing a lot of damage uh, to horses. As we know to other animals also by, by the, the disappearance of natural habitats, and we've done it to ourselves too. Uh, we've done it to, to our own kind. We, we have um, uh, colonized the whole planet. We have been multiplying. And even though we've had many wars, um, we haven't been going on uh, um, with ourselves and others in, in a sustainable way, this we know. And this means, that's what I mean when I say have, being in good relations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's with more than our fellow humans. And so uh, I'm, I gave my horses their freedom back as much as possible. Ideally, this would mean having a territory of a thousand hectares, which we don't have in Europe, except in some places in the mountains, the Alps maybe, or the Pyrenees Mountains, or the Massif Central in France. Um, but in Central Europe, there, there is no more land. This is a big difference uh, between North America and I guess South America and, and uh, Europe. We have no more large spaces. People are everywhere. If you drive through Belgium, you have a, uh, you see everywhere you are in Flanders, you will see a, a, a church tower. Everywhere. There is no more landscape where you do not see a village. It's full. We are full. So how can we give animals freedom back if we don't um, rewild um, the space? We have to stop the, stop the intensive agriculture, stop the intensive education uh, of our children, which we cultivate like uh, land with a a deep, uh, what do you call it, um, to uh, plow, uh, the tool to plow, which is very sharp and digs deep and turns the earth around. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So, and this is killing the, 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 the aerobic soil, the, the top centimeters where all life is. So we're, we're killing everything with our behavior, including femininity in the name of equality and 
we've got something wrong there. It's not about, I, I mean, I respect if people think that. Uh, however, for me, it's not only about equality, it's about specifics. When, the, when I was convinced that women and men are different, and the first time I had to explain what is the difference, I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. I didn't know. So I had to search and ask and, and ask my teachers, and um, they invited me to look myself. So I, the first thing I had to do is to be clear, what is the difference between feminine and masculine? What are we talking about? And most answers that come spontaneously is that we each have a part of feminine and masculine. Okay, it still doesn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we look at animals, uh, they have uh, very different functions in the group, the males and the females, and they don't discuss equality. They don't care. It's not about equality. It's about who has which function. So the males are protectors uh, with horses and, and other herd animals. And when it's mating season, they fight. When it's not mating season, they don't fight. They are very peaceful. They they coexist um, very peacefully. They have bachelor herds, and uh, with the females, there is this one stallion and the children. So, what is happening with our males that today so many males are um, turning against the females in the human species? This is a question where I don't have the answer. I don't know what, what is happening there. There's something very wrong. Um, it's not okay. So we have to correct this. The mothers, the women, we have to say it's not okay. Uh, what's happening with little children and in, in the highest levels or, or layers of society, um, I, I suspect it's the same in, in North America with the Epstein uh, stories and then uh, in Europe where all the judges are pedophiles and they're the ones the women go to when they search for their disappeared children. So there is something very wrong, very sick in the society and this is changing now. The children are standing up, the women are standing up. Look, look at what's happening in Argentina with the women and the feminists, they're turning over everything right now. And this is great, fantastic news. It's happening. We are the ones we're, we're waiting for. And mm -hmm. here we are doing the work. It's happening. So we're dealing with a few challenges also because the, the women um, who are older and who have been looking to find answers to their questions, um, the, the, the younger ones don't always understand uh, that the older people are not there to dominate or give orders, but are there to give support and share wisdom. Mm -hmm. So when I was young, I was looking for these older women. I have found a few, but most of them not in touch with their own roots or spiritual roots. And they've been doing what they can, the best they can. And I did not find these teachers I had to go very far. We, we have no more of these wise old women in Europe. They're coming back. Hmm? Uh, and this is also fantastic news, but there is so much healing to do. We're doing it. And there is no time. The, the seats of the woman, the woman's lodges and the grandmother lodges, the seats are empty. We have no more grandmothers sitting in circles in, in the grandmother lodges. So I'm calling all the women everywhere on the planet, and the menopause the women, the grandmothers, the ones who have had a, a hysterectomy, who have had the uterus who don't have it anymore because of surgery or whatever. All these women, we all have the echo of, of the tides in our womb and of the cycles. It's time. Even if we're not perfect, if we don't have the trainings, if we don't have the teachings, still, Let's sit in circles again. The grandmother seats are empty. Take them. It's now. Yeah, I like that. It's, I mean, the, the biggest thing is just getting back to our roots and celebrating yeah. that and celebrating yeah. the authenticity of it, being ourselves and, and finding that. So I think that's beautiful. And I think that um, it's always a challenge to find the authentic women, but I think when you call them, the right people always come to, to the right place. 
I also think that the, the wild part of us is uh, always alive somewhere. Uh, and so as soon as we find ourselves in nature, where I do my workshops, this I insist on doing them in nature, in beautiful natural surroundings, because as soon as we take our shoes off and we wash a couple of times in the creek, we're back. We're back down to earth. We're back with our naked feet on, feet on the earth. And everything comes back. Uh, it, it takes only once. We make fire once. We show a, a young woman how, or an older woman how to make fire once. She knows. It, it all comes back. But we have to be in the right surroundings. If we put ourselves in cities where the air is, is not nice to smell, where the sounds don't do good to our ears, where, where the, the landscape hurts our eyes with straight lines, um, uh, where the food that we eat is not very healthy, etc. With uh, what we put on our skins, all of this, when we stop putting poisons in, and, and when we stop this, then the body can stop cleaning or cleansing, and then we can start doing the work. So putting ourselves out in nature uh, is more than survival. It's healing, and it's a necessary connection if we want authenticity. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's it's just a natural part of us that we need to celebrate instead of ignoring it and becoming so detached. It's the simplicity of everything, yeah. of food, yeah. of nature, of the environment is is some of the most heal uh, potent healing energy yeah. too. Um, so I will ask you one, two more questions. The first one is, what advice would you give our viewers on how to embrace their individuality and, and celebrate their bodies and, and who they are today? What, what would you tell them? Oh, that's a very nice question. <laughs> um, I have a bit of a problem with the word individuality because we don't exist as individuals. This is a, an artificial creation of, uh, of whatever. Um, uh, I exist, the, the, what we call I, exists always in a context, uh, in an environment. And um, uh, uh, for me, the question is, how can the I, so this word I, how can I offer the best of myself? Uh, what would make me happy and what would be best for the whole everything? And so how can I become the best of, version of myself? Um, by recognizing my own talents and putting them to service. This gives a sense, uh, th this gives me a reason to live and it gives me a place in society, it gives me a place in the world and what I love to do, usually I do it well, it's a pleasure to do it and this is the best I have to offer. So I would, my advice would be stop doing things you don't like doing. Stop doing things that put you in a bad mood or that make you sick or that bore you. Of course, a little bit frustration is good, but too much makes us sick. Mm -hmm. So how can we get out of the rat race? The more of us uh, going out of the rat race now um, and, and putting, uh, recognizing our talents, we come from a culture where, where it is arrogant to, to say, hey, this is my talent, I can do that. Um, it's vanity, it's considered vanity in our society. This is very wrong. It's, it's important to recognize a child's talent and to tell this child, you have this talent. And before that, if we don't recognize it in ourselves, our children will not believe us. So we have to start with ourselves. And when once we know what we love to do and that we do it well and that we get more training and that we do it more, we'll do it better. And there, there will be so many side effects to this for everything and everybody. So it's, it's, um, I'm having a problem with this egoistic way of, of being an individual, me, myself, mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, uh, I encourage everyone to recognize their own talents and, and put them to service. It's so good to help. It's, so, it's such a good feeling to have done something well and to have contributed to something, even if it's the only the little drop of the hummingbird. Mm -hmm. Definitely. No, I, I think that's excellent advice. And I think that puts everything into perspective, too. So 
I will close up the interview. I won't take up too much more of your time, but um, let's talk about how we can find you. Um, what website or books? Tell me about the um, books that you have written because um, I won't try to pronounce them because they're in French. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, the best way that they can find you on the internet, um, either through Facebook, and we can always um, add these links later on too. So just tell us a little bit more about the books you have written too and, and the best way to find you. Okay, so the book uh, in itself is a story. Um, I was doing a, the summer camp, which we do once a year. It's a camp for families, uh, men, women, and children, and also single people can come or everybody's welcome, all ages. And it's in nature with horses. We do circles in the teepee. We use no cell phones, no computers. It's like five days completely cut from the world, full in nature. And so we did this, um, this was 2013, if I remember well. And I asked the group, um, I asked everyone what their dream was, which they told. And w when the circle was over, I was ready to go on. And the whole group screamed in one voice, and you. So I said the first thing that crossed my mind was to take the time uh, for writing a book. And at the end of that uh, summer camp, uh, two people came to me privately at my house and um, asked me to write my adventures, and they gave me um, a huge uh, slab of money for doing it. So I told them I wanted three days to think of it because this couldn't be possible, that someone gives me money to do that. And it was true, so I did. But I did not write in the first person. I didn't want an autobiography, so uh, it's, a, it's a story of a young woman uh, who goes onto an adventure and discovers all kinds of things she hasn't really asked for. Very nice. It sounds like a beautiful read too, to learn more about you and, and peer into that on a different side. Very nice. Mm. So the best way to find me right now is on uh, Facebook because uh, we have a, a website under construction. I'm not very good at this. Someone's doing it for me. And uh, have a couple of blogs, but they're not um, updated. So Facebook is the best way at this point. Perfect. Well, we will be sure to have all the links available um, when we publish this and everything for people to get hold of you. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your great information, your story of how you discovered all of this and, and how you're teaching others. So it was very inspiring. Thank you very much oh, for joining very us. Very welcome. And thanks you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. It was good seeing you. Well, take care. Okay. Bye-bye.